reaching out newsletter. Great publication that comes out quarterly. Um, and you'll also be getting notices of upcoming events. You know, should there be a walk in the woods? Let's hope that happens. Um, should the, the, the next Woodland Wild, the next Woodland Wildlife Wednesday. If you want to opt out on that, that's cool. You can. Pam Thomas, um, you can email her at pthomas at umd.edu. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please put it in the chat box. It's the, it's the one with the icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that and you type in your question or comment and hit enter on your keyboard, um, you'll be able to send us any questions. Um, Heather welcomes any questions and comments. And then when she's done her presentation, I'll go through the, I'll read the questions off. Okay, so something comes to your mind, you can write it in the, in the, in the chat box. So our speaker today, Heather Harmon Disk, she uh, is the forest health entomologist for the Maryland Department of Agriculture forest pest management section. She's involved with coordinating and compiling forest health surveys throughout the state and implements them on the Eastern shore where, she's re where she is regional entomologist. Heather previously worked as an entomologist for the Delaware Department of Agriculture where she assisted with native bee nursery and CAPS survey. Heather received her Bachelor of Science from Marist, I hope I said that okay, College and her Master's of Science at Towson University. During her downtime, Heather runs marathons, fosters kittens, and tries to wrangle her two children. So with that, Heather, I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And uh, you can share your screen. How about that? Sounds good. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. So let's get started. Uh, so my name is Heather Disk and I'm from the Department of Agriculture and we are going to be talking about forest pests. So our first forest pest we're gonna be talking about is the gypsy moth. Um, many people are familiar with gypsy moth. Uh, gypsy moth has not been as big of a problem as it was in the 80s and 90s, but we still do monitor it and we still are um, recommending controls. So you can see here there on the uh, left picture is a male and female gypsy moth. You can see egg masses there in the center. And then you can see some uh, first and second instar caterpillars there on your right. So here what you're looking at is the surveys that were completed between the fall and winter of 19 and 20. So um, we surveyed uh, 483 acres for gypsy moth and 2.9% of them were positive. You can see that the majority of the positives were found on the Eastern shore. And that is also where we had recommended treatment. So um, in general, these are the woodlot areas that we were looking at. You can see the pink is where we found gypsy moth. And then the red, which is um, hard to see, but it is here in Worcester and here in Wicomico, there are two, three actually small spots of red. And so those are the areas where there were over 250 egg masses per acre found. And those are the areas that we recommend for treatments. Uh, so the treatments here, you can see one block in Wicomico County close to Salisbury, which was 29 acres, and then two blocks in Worcester County, totaling 139 acres were sprayed for gypsy moth this year. Uh, so you can see there is a picture of the helicopter that was used for spraying. Uh, we spray with BT. It's a soil bacterium, and uh, so it's used as, um, as a treat as a treatment. Um, other things um, that homeowners can do for treating trees is barrier bands. You can see in the picture on the left, you can see where the caterpillars are going up and they're either stuck on the band or they um, are unable to continue going up to the tree. Um, in addition to that, there are some um, things in the environment 
that assist in keeping populations low. And so we've seen a lot of the Entomophaga mimaiga fungus, and so that's also known as the gypsy moth fungus. Um, you can see caterpillars in the picture on the right. These caterpillars here that are straight up and down, so those caterpillars were killed by the fungus. When caterpillar populations begin to increase to large numbers, the NPV or nucleopolyhedrous virus, that will begin to kill caterpillars. We usually typically see it when caterpillar populations are high. So when you see a caterpillar that is dead on a tree in this V shape, this V shape is um, what happens to the caterpillar when it dies from the virus. So upside down V means that the caterpillar was killed by a virus straight up and down. The caterpillar was killed by the gypsy moth fungus. Um, so we did see um, the Entomophaga mimaiga in populations this um, late spring, early summer. Uh, for the most part, we uh, saw this in um, Worcester County but it is throughout the state. Um, throughout the state, the populations have been increasing. Um, it currently looks like the, there are areas, again, in Worcester and Wicomico that will be, need to be treated in the spring of 2021. Currently, in Garrett County, there is an increase in gypsy moth populations, but it doesn't look like they are to the level where they would be causing um, irreparable damage, and so we are keeping an eye on them. Uh, the next pest I was going to talk about is the walnut twig beetle. Um, so here I, you can see that the beetle is very small. These are full-grown adult beetles on the head of Abraham Lincoln there and a penny. In addition, you can see exit holes in the picture below that. Uh, you can see they are very small and they're very numerous. And so then on the right hand side, you can see here where there are many galleries of the walnut twig beetle and their associated fungus, the um, thousand cankers disease. And so you can see that um, one of the things that the walnut twig beetle does is it's basically a death by a thousand cuts. And so the walnut twig beetle comes in and colonizes and brings a fungus with it. The fungus is what the is the thousand kinkers disease. And so as the beetle starts to consume and tunnel through the wood, the, it's consuming the fungus that it's spreading. And then that fungus kind of goes out from the area and then turns into these cankers. All the cankers kind of coalesce together, as you can see in this picture, and that's what causes the death of the trees. Um, so thousand cankers disease is causing dieback and mortality in eastern black walnut. Uh, one of the things it, that we are seeing currently is, is that areas and forests in Maryland are not seeing the kind of mortality that they saw out in the West. And some of that is um, thought of because these trees are eastern black walnuts and they are in their environment in their um, in the environment and those trees were here and they have their own defenses and so they're able to withstand the stressors of the beetle and the fungus whereas out west those trees were not native and so they weren't able to withstand some of the stressors that are out there in Colorado and out west, as well as being able to withstand the beetle. And so, um, as I said, so in Maryland, we first found this in 2013, and the area that we first found it in Cecil County has not exhibited uh, mortality. There is um, some small amount of dieback, but it um, is not as damaging as we had previously thought. Um, currently, scientists are thinking that it might take about 10 years for us to see some sort of damage from walnut twig beetle and thousand cankers disease. So we have a few more years to go. Um, so again, the fungus is what causes the cankers to be formed under the bark and the cankers coalesce and girdle the trees. So where are our walnut twig beetle traps? So you can see them throughout the state. Um, 
the majority of them are in Cecil and Baltimore counties and Baltimore cities because that's where we found the beetle previously. We can see the positives in 2019 were um, inside Baltimore City and Baltimore County. So those areas we had known were positive for the walnut twig beetle and thousand cankers disease. So we were doing a delimiting survey. You can kind of see the big circle of traps to see where the beetle had spread. And so currently those traps are still within, oops, and click too fast. Let's get back. So you can see those traps are still within the current thousand canker disease and walnut tree beetle quarantine. So the quarantine is the initial 21 square miles up in Cecil County. The beetle has not moved outside of that since 2013. And then the addition in 2018 of Baltimore City and Baltimore County to the quarantine. Um, and so that is approximately 185 square miles. So what does this quarantine mean? It just means that um, any walnut wood and um, trees, any wood products made of walnut has to go through um, the a treatment process or just in general cannot be moved without being destroyed outside of those areas. Uh, something else we look for is the Cyrex wood wasp. So um, these are non-natives. Uh, we do have native sericids that we do catch when we're collecting for Cyrex wood wasp. Um, these are, um, these adults emerge in July through September. Um, they are currently found in Northern Pennsylvania and Southern New York. Um, and they have not moved from those areas. And so the Cyrex quarantine that was put in place by the USDA is no longer because these wasps were not moving. What do they look like? There's what they look like. They are large wasps. Um, you would definitely notice them. So here are their preferred hosts here, additional hosts in the United States and some other pine species that are at risk um, so the thing that, um, the reason why we're still surveying for these, even though they are no longer quarantined, is that you can see there Loblolly pine is one of the preferred hosts and other southern pine species. And so even though the wasps are in the north, they are not in their preferred hosts. And so it's been shown in South America in Loblolly plantations that they that Cyrex noctilio can cause significant damage. And so we want to make sure that if the Cyrex noctilio is going to move into our southern pines, that we are aware of it so that if it does start to cause that sort of risk and damage here, that we can um, be on top of it quickly. So the good news is, is that um, we haven't found any. And so you can see our traps throughout the state. The majority of them are in that northern tier. So we assume that that's where the threat would be. Um, and again, these are the the trap. The map says from 2019, but these are actually the exact same locations for the 2020 traps, and the 2020 traps are also negative for Cyrex noctilio. Hemlock woolly adelgid. So um, hemlock woolly adelgid, you can see it there in the upper left hand corner. Um, it's a non-native and uh, we do do treatments, both chemical and biological. Um, most all of our treatments are done on um, public lands. You can see um, when we started treating in 2004 until current the 2020, um, we try to treat um, both through trunk injection and soil injection. Uh, so the chemical is imidacloprid that we use. You can see um, the, ma the majority of our trunk injection trees are trees that are within 50 feet of a body of water. And that could be a stream, a pond, um, a spring. So we try to make sure that um, we're as environmentally safe as possible. The 50 foot buffer is actually the largest buffer in our region. And so, um, 
that's where those trunk injection trees are from. Soil injection trees are trees that are past that 50 foot buffer from any body of water. Cortec there is also another type of soil um, treatment. And so you can see we've treated over 103,000 trees. So some of those are retreatments. Um, we do try to um, do sampling surveys every year as well as winter mortality surveys to determine where the population is going to increase, what trees need to be treated, and um, specific areas that are high at high risk and high use would be treated prior to areas that are less, um, less high risk due to populations or due to the um, potential for um, human interaction. And so um, some of these areas, most of them are in our western counties, but um, as you can see here, there are several uh, hemlock stands that we have treated um, across the state. So um, you can see there's even one um, in Queen Anne's and Talbot County. And um, to update you that we just started treating one in Calvert County, um, just outside of Solomon's Island. So that's kind of exciting too. Uh, the majority of the stands are in Garrett and Allegheny. Um, again, these are all on public lands. Uh, we also release um, predators. So you can see um, where we have released hemlock woolly adelgid predators. Uh, the majority of the predators are Laracopius nigrinus. And I'll show you a picture of that in the next slide. There it is at the bottom. So you can see um, we've released over 27, almost 28,000 um, Laracopius nigrinus individuals. And so some of them, you can see the majority not the majority, but the largest number are done at Rocky Gap State Park. So at Rocky Gap State Park, we have been able to establish an insectary for the Laracopius nigrinus. And so what that means is, is that now and in the future, that population should be large enough that we can actually take beetles that are wild caught from Maryland and release them into other Maryland sites. The majority of these beetles that you're seeing, the Laracopius nigrinus beetles, are wild caught from the western part of the United States. Uh, there is, um, we do have a um, Laracopius rubidus that is part of um, our current um, environment. And so those beetles can hybridize with nigrinus, um, but it hasn't been shown to cause an effect, and the Laracobius nigrinus has been shown to be a very good predator of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, you can see we've tried a few other things. Um, there's two fly species, and, um, and we are currently still looking for a summer predator, so the Laracobius nigrinus is very good um, the winter through spring, but it seems to be that a summer predator would help bring down the hemlock willy adelgid populations to an even um, easier to manage level. And, but unfortunately, there's been some issues. And so um, we are no longer releasing skinless populations. And um, we're, the researchers are still on the lookout for a good summer predator. Uh, moving on, beech bark disease. Um, so beech bark disease does call mortality, cause mortality in American beech. Um, it's a two-part problem, kind of like the walnut twig beetle. There's the walnut twig beetle and the fungus causes stalls and cankers disease. This is a non-native beech scale that also has a fungus. So the scale attacks and allows an infection by the fungus. And so this fungus attack is what weakens the trees. And then you can see there's um, beach, beach, then they're prone to beach snap in windy conditions. So here you can see some pictures and images. Um, on the left is the beach infected by scale, beach infected by then the fungus and the scale, and some of the bark damage that can be done. Currently, um, our positive beach bark locations are in Garrett, 
and Western Allegheny counties. Um, we have uh, beach bark disease permanent plots that are set up to monitor the effect of beach bark disease. So currently there's about 15,000 acres that we have marked that have beach bark disease. Some of the good news with that is, is that there are um, beach bark resistant trees in the environment. And so you, some of these trees you'll be, see have had the fungus attack them and they are still living. So um, we are also monitoring beach bark disease when we look for beach leaf disease. Which is my next slide. So beach leaf disease is found in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. And is causing beach decline. So you can see here in this picture, this is a picture from the underside of a beech leaf looking up into the canopy that I took when I was in Ohio. So you can see the um, striping that occurs and the yellowing here over here on the um, that you can see. So it's causing this sort of, the, the main thing you'll notice first is this sort of striping within the leaf margins, um, but you'll also see um, leaf curling and leaf defects, as well as this yellowing kind of um, bubbling, I guess, um, if you want to call it that, that you'll see in the leaves. And so um, what this has been linked to is a nematode. So in symptomatic leaves that are showing these symptoms, as well as buds, there has been a nematode that has been found. And so um, they're doing research to determine um, how exactly the nematode is being spread and um, why it's causing this kind of damage. And so in Ohio, they found that saplings and smaller trees have died within three years of showing these leaf symptoms. Um, some of the and that's one of the things that you'll notice too when you're walking into a forest, you'll notice that the under canopy of beech is completely gone. And so um, that's one of the things that you'll notice. And also, um, I know that a lot of people would still like to look for beech leaf disease. And so you can still see these symptoms even once the leaves have fallen to the ground. And so I guess I um, didn't put in the map for this year, but we have done 10 surveys for beech leaf disease in every county, as well as set up permanent plots, 15 of them throughout the state. And we have not found any symptoms of beech leaf disease currently in Maryland. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about was um, declining oak. oak. Um, so many people have um, heard about the rapid white oak mortality and um, you can see here, this is a picture from the National Arboretum in Washington, DC that I took in September of last year. And so you can see there are still healthy oaks around them and you can see this kind of, this white oak here that has, that was in rapid decline and died. So uh, we began an oak wilt and declining oak survey. And so um, oak wilt here, you can see this is what the um, fungus pad will look like under the bark. You can also see some oak wilt symptoms here on leaves. And so what we found in our survey was actually that um, it was not oak wilt, calling, oak wilt causing these severe declines. We did find oak wilt in one survey in Allegheny County. Uh, this was an area that had been previously known to have oak wilt, so it wasn't a surprise. We can see throughout the state that it's not just one Thing that's causing these declines. So you can see there's bacterial leaf scorch, that's the yellow color um, that is throughout the state. You can see there have been uh, root rots, Phytophthora root rots. You can see those in the green also throughout the state. Um, I would like to note that this is Phytophthora cinnamoni. This is not Phytophthora remorum. So Phytophthora remorum is um, the um, <laughs> Sorry, this is uh, the Phytophthora that causes the um, death of sudden oak death um, is what people call it. So this is not the Phytophthora that causes sudden oak death. This is a different type of 
Phytophthora, but it also attacks the roots of trees. So you can see that is also throughout the state. Um, one of the newer diseases that has been found is the purple, it's the Plodia corticula. So um, you can see that it's also throughout the state. That's also um, what had been previously thought of to be a secondary pest. So a pest that would cause um, decline, but not necessarily mortality. Um, there's been another Diplodia, Diplodia porcivora. And so that was um, out in Western Maryland that was found and described. And so that was typically something that was thought of to only be in the Southern part of the United States, but it is here in Maryland. It was not the one that we saw significant in our survey. Uh, we saw the Diplodia corticula, but you can see it there. Um, additional survey points were done in 2020. We do not have those results back. Those include um, adding in all of the Eastern shore. So there was um, lots of samples taken along the Eastern shore this year, as well as um, throughout the state again. Uh, so here's just, if that graph before was a little bit too much for you, I have them broken out. So you can see there is the one positive for oak wilt. Here is the survey results for the Diplodia corticula. So you can see them throughout the state and even in Southern Maryland, the Phytophthora cinnamoni, you can see the positives here. There were some, um, you can see some samples did not come with soil. So those we don't know about for those areas, but um, you can see it's, it's generally throughout the um, center portion of our state as well as bacterial leaf scorch. There was many areas um, that were positive for that. Um, move, so moving on, we have emerald ash borer. Um, so we still trap for emerald ash borer. We trap mainly in our non-positive counties so that those were Somerset, Wicomico, and Worcester. So this year we did find um, Somerset County was positive for emerald ash borer. So with the number of beetles we collected in the trap, we are assuming that this and from the fact that the trap was so far away from our previously known positives of emerald ash borer, we're assuming that this was a human introduction, um, likely through the movement of infested wood. Um, there were five other traps that were positive, and uh, we'll show those in a second. Um, those were all in our areas that we are releasing parasitoids. So we are still doing parasitoid releases. We released at seven locations this year, and I'll show those guys soon. And then we also treat trees. Um, so we assisted treating trees this year on um, public lands and um, and so I will show a little bit of that as well. So adult traps. So that's what you're seeing here, the positives for the adult traps that we were setting up. Um, so you can see um, Baltimore, Harford, Cecil, Kent, those were all previously known positives and those are areas where we're releasing parasitoids. Those were positive this year. And then the big one is this trap here down in Somerset. So our previously known collection of emerald ash borer is here in Dorchester County, right here. As you can see, it is a distance away and we did not collect beetles in any of these other traps. Uh, emerald ash borer treatment locations. So we were hampered this year significantly by the COVID-19 restrictions. And so we were only able to do um, some very small limited treatments. Um, so there were treatments done by the Maryland Conservation Corps out in Garrett County. Uh, there was one tree treated in Washington. Um, there, and then there were two um, state parks that were treated in Talbot and Somerset. And there was um, some treatments bun, done by uh, Maryland DNR at parks in Car Caroline. That's um, the Tuckahoe State Park Complex. Um, in addition, I did want to show this because it is kind of interesting and I'm just checking my time. Okay. Um, so we do do natural area treatments. And so um, these are a little bit different. They're not at um, area park areas where the trees would come in contact with hikers or um, campers. These are areas that are kind of like out in um, the backcountry, so to speak. 
And these are areas where what we're trying to do is to save seed stock as well as keep some of these areas, specifically Walnut Landing, Plum Creek, Black these Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge properties from totally losing their ash component and, um, and also losing their ash that are rare species. And so what that looked like is this. And so you can see it's a very wet endeavor. Um, we often have to kayak to some of these locations because there are no roads to be able to get our treatment equipment there. Um, and so you can see here is um, an ash tree and um, they're very harsh conditions, but these trees um, can be up to 90 years old. And so um, these areas are often 40 to 50% ash. And uh, so it would be very significant to lose 50% of the trees in these areas. Specifically, um, it would be, it, it's gonna be a problem. Um, to see what will happen if they will remain forests or turn into marshland. And so um, we're trying to save some of the seed stock here for the future. And um, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's definitely not um, what we're used to <laughs> being out on the water. Um, Emerald Ash Borer Parasitoid locations. So you can see they're also throughout the state. And um, what are we releasing? So we are releasing um, four parasitoids, and I don't have a picture of the fourth one, but uh, we do releases of Oobia cigrelli. That's an egg parasitoid that's up here. Um, you can see it's very small. This is an egg of emerald ash borer. It actually parasitizes it. We release two species of Spathius, um, Spathius cigrelli and Spathius galini. Spathius galini actually has a longer ovipositor um, than this Spathius cigrelli. And so, um, it is actually better suited to save some of our, hopefully save some of our larger trees. And so we have been working with the um, Beneficial Insects Laboratory in Newark, Delaware, to be able to provide us with some of these Spathius galini. And so this year, um, we released a significant amount in six of our parks. And so we're very excited about that new collaboration. Um, we also do some Tetrasicus releases. Um, these, both of these three species are larval parasitoids. Um, so they attack larvae. And um, the Tetrasicus we are mainly releasing out in Western Maryland. There is some debate on, um, on where it should be released. And so currently the lab that we're receiving the parasitoids from um, only has us releasing those out West. Where have we done releases? Um, so historically, uh, the releases started in 2009 here in PG County. Uh, that's where the Emerald Ash Borer was known. And then as uh, Emerald Ash Borer increased and moved throughout the state, we've um, been releasing uh, throughout. And so um, in the beginning, this was done by the plant protection section of the Maryland Department of Agriculture. And it's, um, there's also been research releases done by the University of Maryland Entomology Department and the Benef USDA Beneficial Insects Lab. And then um, since uh, 2016, we at Forest Pest Management have been doing the releases. Southern pine beetle. Um, so southern pine beetle hasn't been a problem in the last couple of years, but it did cause a significant uh, mortality event in Dorchester County beginning in 2015 that lasted until 2017. So you can see here, this is an actual aerial image of the devastation in the Dorchester area. Uh, so it was about 300 acres uh, that saw 100% uh, mortality. And so it began here in this section and then uh, jumped the road to here and here. Uh, you can see there was um, we were able to contact landowners. And so for Southern pine beetle, the treatments that are required um, is mostly um, is cutting and uh, getting ahead of the movement of the Southern pine beetle. And so you can see since we were watching the beetle move from this woodlot to this woodlot, um, they had come in and done a um, clear cut here in this part of the forest. And so you can see the beetle basically stopped and didn't jump. And so that is due to um, the beetle's pheromone so 
with southern pine beetle, they have an aggregation pheromone. And so that basically calls all of the beetles to attack a tree that the beetles deem is, um, is a good food source. And so as more and more beetles come to an area because of an aggregation pheromone, then the trees begin to become weakened and then they start releasing a pheromone. And it's kind of, um, it's both a stress tree pheromone and the aggregation pheromone cause more and more beetles to come to an area. And then that is what causes damage. So we do see Southern pine beetle throughout Maryland. Um, it typically does not cause damage, but if you want, this is what an adult Southern pine beetle looks like. There's a grain of rice, and this is a black turpentine beetle, which is another um, beetle that also is in our environment. And so this is um, what the beetle looks like from egg to adult. Uh, this is the kind of damage that it causes. Um, a lot of times when you are looking at Southern pine beetle populations, you're kind of watching the tree go from green to yellowing to then once it completely dies and the beetles have left, it starts this um, bright red flagging. And so you know, you'll notice that when you're doing aerial um, flights and ground flight ground truthing. Um, when you're also on the ground, you can see what they call these popcorn tubes. So this is the tree's response to try to get all of these beetles out. And so um, these are often, again, what you can see when there's a southern pine beetle infestation. And then also southern pine beetles like walnut twig beetle carry a fungus with them. And you can see this blue stain fungus um, in the wood. So here's my good news slide, is that southern pine beetle was only collected in one trap in Calvert County this year. The rest of our traps throughout the state were negative. So that's some good news. Um, other areas that we look at are saltwater intrusion. So when we're doing our southern pine beetle um, surveys, we're also looking for um, forests that are affected by saltwater intrusion. So you can see where the areas that we mapped in 2019 were. The majority of them are in um, Dorchester, Somerset, um, Wicomico, and Worcester counties. Um, so you can see there's some along Astigue Island um, and then the rest are mostly along the bay. And uh, the other thing to note is, is that these forests are not being lightly damaged. This is a moderate to very severe category is the majority of the acreage, actually all of the acreage mapped in 2019. And so when the survey was done in 2020, I don't have the map up yet, but they were in these same areas and we saw about 30,000 acres um, being affected by saltwater intrusion. Uh, we also survey for exotic Asian defoliators. And um, so the thing about these is, is that there is an Asian gypsy moth and a rosy gypsy moth that have been found at the Port of Baltimore. And, um, and so what we do is we set up uh, pheromone traps along the bay, along the canal, and along the train depot in Cumberland to try to detect if these moths have escaped outside of the shipping channel, outside of the ships that have been found to be positive in the Port of Baltimore. And so currently we have not found any suspect moths and we've been doing this um, for four years now. And so we have found no, um, no moths, and we do survey for eight different species of um, exotic Lamantria and ginger limus. So additional pests, uh, we do look at forest tent caterpillar. So we did see some damage by uh, forest tent caterpillar in Wicomico and Worcester counties. Uh, we also do survey for laurel wilt and the red bay ambrosia beetle. So that has been moving um, further north. Uh, we did not find any. We do an early detection rapid response, which is mainly for um, those bark beetles and ambrosia beetles um, looking for new uh, invasives and we did not find any this year. We also survey for additional oak pests. Uh, so an uh, agrilis um, beetle uh, moth, the oak processionary moth and two additional ambrosia beetles and we did not find any of those. Um, we have seen, been looking at ash rust, um, eastern tin caterpillar, webworm, and there even was some walking stick damage out in Washington County. 
Um, so that's just some of the additional stuff that we also look at. And finally, I did want to mention um, quickly spotted lanternfly. If you happen to see any of these egg masses, uh, you won't see the nymphs at this time of year, but any adults still hanging on through the frost, please take a picture, um, capture the insect, you know, freeze it, and uh, email this don'tbug.md at maryland.gov. We are um, the plant protection section of MDA is still working hard even through our COVID restrictions to try to um, map where this is so that um, there can be an appropriate response, treatment response that's um, done currently through the USDA. So just my plug there. So finally, here's a view of Vassity Garland. Uh, you can see there's here's some southern pine beetle damage, but it is beautiful. Um, and then also I have all of our, um, we do have five regional offices, Central, Eastern Shore, which I'm at the Northeast, uh, our Annapolis office and the, an office out West. So if you happen to be across the state, here is the information to get in touch with your local regional office. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, that was great. Oh my gosh, so much information. When we did this um, practice session, I asked a lot of questions and I do have some other questions, but let's go to what the people are asking about. Thank you, Heather. So thorough, so great. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so it, you if- you need to stop I, sharing? Uh, well, let's keep it up because I think one of the questions you may want to go to one of your slides just just okay. in case because really my slide would have been contact information and I think this is more appropriate really it has all the regions um so if Cyrix Noctilio can you say that again uh -huh. yep Cyrix Noctilio oh okay. mm -hmm. is not here yet if, if Cyrix noctilio is not here yet, what has caused all the local pine to die off? He, go, he goes on to say, lost all pines and all ash of the 50 acres I steward. He did not say what county or region he's from. Okay. Um, so um, there has been a couple of white pine issues. Um, so there's been um, some uh, the diseases that had been previously known to white pine, but not known to cause mortality that have been causing issues. And um, I don't know those off the top of my head, um, but they are affecting um, white pines in West Virginia and Pennsylvania significantly. So um, if that, if you're in those areas, then, um, you know, I, you, we can be in contact and I can get you that information. Um, for pines on the Eastern shore, um, we've seen a lot of issues with saltwater intrusion. Um, so with changing soils, it has um, in that in, in combination with additional stressors, uh, both environmental and um, through insect stressors, they're just causing the trees to die off. And so it's not just one thing, it's probably three or four different things. And the ash, I'm, so I mean, if it's a ash forest, you know, that uh, emerald ash borer has been in most of our areas for over 10 years. And so those trees are really, they might look fine one, one year and the next year they're gone. And that's just, they just didn't have anything left. Hmm. Great. He did say that he's from Frederick County. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, the pines then would probably have more of that, the white pine issues. And um, so those are, they're just different diseases that are causing issues. Um, you can like wilts and all that kind of stuff. If you see a lot of bleeding, kind of like cankers that are oozing. And um, yeah, emerald ash borer has been in Frederick for a long time. And so it's just that time. Okay. And if he wants to get in contact with someone, he would go to the central region office there. And Correct. On the top of the list there. Yep. Um, is there an image, and I think that you may have had it, is there an image of the tr what the trap looks like for that Cyrix? Yep, mm-hmm, yep, yep, yep. It's mm -hmm. a, is it that long thing? What yep, so we thing? have, um, so we have Lingren funnels, and um, so I did, let's see here, I did forget to mention that. Um, let's see. 
Lingren, Lingren. Lin yeah, li so here's what it looks like. Um, so that's the same trap that we use for um, for a lot of our things. So the walnut twig beetle, Cyrex, southern pine beetle, the um, other ambrosia beetles. Um, these are all we put the lures onto these types of traps. And then there is a cup full of antifreeze at the bottom. So the beetle is a, attracted to either a sex pheromone or stress tree pheromone or an aggregation pheromone. And then um, they kind of come towards the trap and then fall through the funnels and into the cup. Oh, okay. So it's not, uh, it's not a screw. <laughs> no. <You know? laughs> yeah. A little bit like a screw. Oh, that was interesting. I think you described that so nicely. Okay. So then, okay. So the, does the antifreeze work as both um, like a destroyer and a preserver? Of Correct. The, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. So the next question, if we find Cyrix are there treatments that we think might be effective beyond forest management for healthy stocking densities? Uh, I think that is currently the main suggestion is um, healthy stocking densities and um, being able to uh, kind of, you know, keep the beetle contained, or not keep the beetle, that's southern pine beetle, keep the wasp contained. And so um, it would be, you know, a removal of infested stock, a removal of stock um, surrounding the infested stock, and then um, just trying to make sure that trees are healthy so they're able to withstand any sort of additional infestation. Great. You mentioned a lot of points there. Um, what, what was going through my head while you were talking was, wow, this is integrated pest management to its best, right? We're talking about um, mechanical ways, removing things, biological controls, and, you know, chemical controls. I think um, this has been great in terms of seeing how the department is using integrated pest management. This is great. Um, one of the I forget my other questions that I had. You had said, anyway, I'll go on to the next person's question. Once the disease, and I think this was when you were talking about beech bark uh, disease. Mm -hmm. Once the disease is found, is it too late to remove trees to prevent further infection? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. So once the disease- so, um... So really it's about trying to um, keep the trees healthy and keep the scale down. And so if you can, uh, you know, remove the uh, scale down and I mean, there are scale treatments that you can do mostly bark sprays um, that can control the beach scale. So um, if you can keep the scale down in the fungal load down by removing those infested trees, then you have a better chance of keeping the disease contained. So this was one of my questions. Uh, the scale, is that a bug or what yes. is a scale exactly? Yep. Okay. It's an insect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I liked how you said keep the trees healthy. So what advice do you have for keeping trees healthy? Mm, that's a good one. Um, so, you know, not having trees overstocked, certainly, um, especially for a lot of our um, Lavalli um, areas, we're seeing just overstocked, dense trees. Um, uh, like trying to, um, you know, the hard part is, is that a lot of what we've been seeing that are causing stress is environmental. And so you can't always control water. Um, you can't control the way that the, um, the storms come. And so, um, you know, just trying to have the right tree in the right place and planning for the future, I think is really, um, really important. Great, great. I liked how, how you were talking about kind of some timber stand improvement practices by lowering that density. And I would think that removing some of invasive plant species would also keep that, that, that 
the, those trees healthy too. It's not just necessarily going in and fertilizing your tree right. and, you know, bringing it a cup of tea or a hot toddy or a little <laughs> spoonful of honey or anything like that. <laughs> so, um, okay, great. Um, yeah, I think, you know, really if, you know, if you're just trying to, um, sorry, I just lost my point, but really it's a lot of it is, especially with some of these beetles and other things, a lot of times they find stress three, stressed trees through pheromones. And so if you can um, keep the level of trees that are stressed to a minimum, then there'll be less of those pheromones to bring less of those um, insects into your environment. So the pheromone that's being released by the unhealthy tree. Mm -hmm. is will attract insects um, to the tree itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Wow, that was good. Okay, so then we have a comment here. When working with the Maryland DNR restoration, they planted, they had a pro, they, we had a project along the Marshy Hope in Federalsburg where they collected pumpkin ash seeds and had Mount Cuba grow them out. We then planted seedlings on the site and she hasn't been there yet recently to see if they've survived. So people are doing, doing stuff to replace that emerald ash borer damage. Yep. And there, is, um, there was a concerted effort to get um, black ash, Carolina ash, and pumpkin ash seeds to a seed, um, to the seed, like the seed bank. Um, and so there are seeds from our area that are being kept um, to help with that as well. So there has been done some seed saving work done. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a question here about climate change. Uh, what about the effects of climate change? Are these insects moving north from southern territories or are they non-native? I love that non-native question because that's southern pine beetle. Anyway, I'll let, yeah. So is what are, are yeah. what, what about the effects of climate change? Are these insects moving north from southern territories or are they non-native? Yeah, so um, there's definitely been um, effects from um, climate change. And so um, as far as um, moving north, um, I think some like the Red Bay Ambrosia beetle, um, that one might be moving a little bit further north. However, um, I think what we're seeing is, is that we're going to see an increase in populations of insects. And, um, and so because they'll either have more time in their development or a less, har less harsh winter that, will, that causes mortality, um, mm -hmm. we'll see these, in, these populations increase. And so I don't necessarily think that um, a lot of what we have been seeing is um, directly a cause, but I, I think it's certainly not helping the issue. And I think it's only going to get worse. And I think um, one of the things that really puts this to home is how the hemlock woolly adelgid. So when we had those two uh, polar vortex winters, the hemlock woolly adelgid population went way, way, way down. And uh, we had a lot of areas that had no hemlock woolly adelgid anymore. And, um, and so actually it ended up being a problem because there was no food to be able to um, provide our laboratory partners to help them raise beetles um, because we just didn't have any hemlock woolly adelgid. But as our winters become less severe, there's, and certainly the polar vortex years were very severe. Um, but even as our winters are less severe, we're seeing less of that die off. And so um, it definitely will be a problem in the future, um, even greater than it is currently. And I think um, in addition, like the Southern pine beetle, um, while it's not necessarily causing a major problem right now, it has been causing problems and it's been found as high up as um, Long Island. And so I think that too is another thing that some of these, um, some of like Southern pine beetle is native. So some of these native um, populations have always been kept in check, um, but they might not be anymore. Especially I think with, I think our main problem is the rising tides. And so as more water comes 
um, into our forested areas, it's going to cause more stress to our trees as with that saltwater intrusion and more stress to the trees is just going to cause the um, beetle populations to increase and just cause a general mortality. To the trees. Um, uh, you mentioned saltwater intrusion there. So I noticed on your map um, that was 2019 had 10,000 acres, but then it was stated that in 2009, 30,000 acres were affected. Can you explain that difference a little bit? Nope, certainly. So let me get back to that. Let's see, where is that? <laughs> I think it was this. Um, nope, that's how much will I gel it. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Near the Take end, care. I think. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so um, so the difference is, is that um, you can see like a majority of um, the Dorchester over the Dorchester forests here in the south um, and in the um, northeast weren't surveyed in 2019. So um, the 20,000 acres, um, when you're looking at it, there's a lot of forest here and all throughout um, the lower part of the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge that had that was affected um, and that was surveyed in 2020. And so that's the majority of where those 20,000 acres came. But in addition, um, there was a lot of areas up here um, that um, along this edge here of the Nanticoke that we saw some um, light and um, some light uh, discoloration. And so those areas um, in combination with the majority of the lower southern half and northeastern half of Dorchester are what attributes to that 30,000 acre number. Wow. So when I think about the saltwater intrusion and what you said earlier, so they're being inundated by salt water, then the trees are releasing that hormone calling all the and the insects to come. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this person uh, may have missed, she, she's apologizing for coming in late. Okay. And her question is about red and chestnut oaks. She lives in Northwest Baltimore County mm -hmm. and we are losing our oaks. We can see damage to the bark, but don't know if that is secondary. The trees decline for a while and then suddenly rapidly die. Any ideas what could be causing this? Whoa, that map that you have about yeah, that that yeah. map you have about that complexity with the oak oak health. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so you know, obviously, I can't tell her specifically, but um, here in this area, um, so um, really, uh, so with oaks, you know, there's. Uh, longhorn beetles and bupressed beetles that are native that colonize the trees. So, you know, you could be seeing a, a large round um, exit hole to trees, or you could be seeing a D-shaped exit holes that are similar to emerald ash borer in those trees. And so those are going to be the kind of things um, that you would, you might be seeing on the bark that you were talking about. But um, in addition, a lot of what we think, I mean, you can see here, you know, you're gonna, you're probably have some bacterial leaf scorch, some Phytophthora root rot, you could have that Diplodia corticula, um, and the, all those are causing your tree to be weakened. And then, you know, we had that year of drought, and then we had success, a successive year of extreme, um, we had the extreme wetness and then we had extreme drought and so that in and of itself is going to cause stress to the tree so all those stress factors wrapped up together is what we're thinking is causing some of this rapid um, white oak mortality and they're not sure if in addition to that maybe some of these trees were trees that had grown quickly um, and so if that um, if that hadn't caught if that had caused some um, initial um, stress factors or it's all, I don't know, it's all interconnected and we haven't been able to have one thing that we can tell anyone. So um, yeah, it's, it's probably a lot of both.
very complex, these, this, this oak decline. Uh, so I'm noticing that it's one o'clock. Um, thank you all. It, it, we're gonna continue on with the conversation. Uh, we're gonna go for, we're gonna try and get through these questions. But if you're signing off right now, thank you for joining us. Um, our next one is gonna be in January. So January 20th or 27th with Jim McCann. He's the zoologist for the Wildlife and Heritage Sur Service. So um, happy holidays, y'all, if you're gonna be signing off now, but we're gonna continue with the conversation. Uh, we're gonna go through these, we're gonna go through these questions, but happy holidays, y'all, and we'll see you hopefully in January. And for those of you that are sticking around, let's get through these questions. All right, so we have a question here about the spotted lanternfly. Has it been found in Maryland? Yes, uh, so it has been found in um, in um, Cecil and Hartford counties, and there are populations there. Um, so those are currently under quarantine. It has also been found um, in a satellite population in Washington County, and so um, right now they are trying to eradicate that um, population there, and um, and so that one that county is currently not under quarantine. And of course, they found spotted lanternfly adults that are dead that were hitchhikers uh, throughout the state in various counties. And uh, since, uh, you know, when they get those reports of the hitchhikers that are dead, they go out to the property and do a survey, um, a quarter mile survey, and uh, look to see if they find any populations, and they have not so far. So currently, Hartford and Cecil are our quarantine counties and where there are populations um, thriving, unfortunately. Can you show us what those egg masses look like again? Yep, they were, absolutely. They're, they're hard to see if, um, you know, you, do, you don't get it pointed out because look at how good they're, they are. They're very cryptic. So there's one, two, you, you three, see her, her, uh, four. Uh, her pointer circling around them on that on yeah. the on the branch there. Sorry to interrupt you there, but you were counting them. Yep. Nope. So there. I mean, you so you can see four there. Um, so they do. Um, they do love ailanthus trees, tree of heaven, and so um, you can certainly go there. But they do lay their egg masses everywhere. Um, so it could be underneath of a picnic bench or on top of. Uh, iron gate. Um, they really don't discriminate on where they lay their egg masses. Yeah, very, very, uh, they're good at camouflaging uh, on that tree trunk. Uh, she counted four egg masses on there and, you know, you can barely even see that there's even one. So um, I think that's that's important for us to really get that in our head that seeing it on the tree what what it could look like mm -hmm. um so then people are saying with uh with the spotted lantern fly to remove all alanthus so is it because we want to remove alanthus so tree of heaven uh if we want if we're to remove tree of heaven because that is integral to their life cycle. If they don't have tree of heaven, then they can't complete their life cycle. Is that what I understand or? Yes, mm -hmm. that is the current. Um, so they need, there's something in tree of heaven that the researchers believe that they need in order to, to successfully, they might be able to successfully complete their life cycle, but they would not, um, they would not have, be able to like produce um, offspring successfully. And so there's something in Tree of Heaven that allows them to be um, successful in not only surviving, but reproducing. And oh, so with the removal of Alanthus, you're removing um, their preferred host. And um, you're also um, kind of taking away that um, whatever it is that is within the tree that they seem to need. And uh, so for the most part, um, Alanthus removal is recommended um, in large areas um, where there's known populations, um, there's also a recommendation for trap trees. So those would be um, male ailanthus trees that are treated with an insecticide. And so the, um, the uh, spotted lanternfly would come to the tree 
uh, try to consume the tree and then die um, from being exposed to the insecticide. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something else to think of, but for, but really um, for most landowners right now, um, removal of Alanthus is recommended. Okay. Um, this was an interesting question. Do you know of any studies that are done in nurseries that sell trees to the public for and or for stream restoration? Um, so, um, so studies um, like of nurseries, like do there are the plant protection section does survey nurseries for um, insect pests. Um, you know, any sort of nursery um, in Maryland that has um, that has perennials um, would be surveyed for insect pests. Um, I don't know of uh, researchers that are in nurseries specifically. Um, certainly, the plant protection section not only do they survey. Uh, for pests and diseases, but they also uh, provide uh, provide um, inspections to be able to move those um, material around according to guidelines provided by either other states or by the insect pest um, that is that they're looking for. So if it, you know nobody's selling ash, but if they were to sell ash, that they would be looking for emerald ash borer and, um, and then being able to, if they're following specific guidelines, being able to certify it as um, pest free. Okay, so is, well, I guess we're getting maybe into a little different topic here when I ask this question, but is that a thing at nurseries saying uh, pet, pest free? Like, should I be looking for that? Um, so I don't know if it's, I don't think it's a, um, a, a selling tactic. I mean, it certainly is for things like firewood. Um, so there's, you know, a shield. Um, but like for palm trees and other palms and um, other kind of um, soil stock that comes from areas that have red imported fire ants, I mean, they would be certifying that they are red imported fire ant free. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for specifically. Like there's, I don't think there's any like blanket, like certified pest free, um, but for specific things there is. Um, so, you know, whenever you see palm trees down in Ocean City, you would be seeing tr trees that have come through an inspection service. Okay. Uh, we got another question here about the oaks. Um, mm -hmm. They were describing the leaves have rust color patches and their branches are dying and breaking off tree, especially facing south. What is causing this? We kind of reviewed that in the complexity of oak decline. So I'm not sure if there's any more you want to add to that. No, mm -mm. there's, you know, there's just, there's, um, there is a large amount of uh, diseases that cause lots of different types of um, leaf damage and branch dieback. And I'm just not well versed in them. I would say if you're very concerned about your trees and your property that um, you should either, you can um, get in touch with uh, one of your, one of our offices um, here, or you can take a sample to um, Karen Rain at the University of Maryland Plant Diagnostic Laboratory. She's very good and she's actually the one who's been running all of our um, samples. And so whether it be, um, you know, leaf branch samples, um, you know, she can help you uh, with some of those things if we can't. And I'm going to put a plug in there. I think landowners would be, uh, it's very accessible, the University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Center online. Um, you can uh, put in your picture of your tree, write that description that was written there, and then they respond to you within about 24, 48 hours. So I definitely recommend the University of Maryland, if you Google University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Center uh, online, um, th th they can help. So we got uh, some some congratulations and some praise. Great job, thanks, Drake. If I if I know that's the Drake, I think thank you. Um, yes, somebody's seeing some round holes in the bark. So I'm wondering if they're talking about the walnuts. You know, I looked at the walnuts at where I work, and I didn't see any. So 
Amy wrote that comment. I wonder if she's talking about her walnut trees there. We got to thank you for the presentation. We got to, this may be unrelated, but I've noticed that dying oaks may have, uh, have many, many garlic mustard plants circling the trees. Is this a result of the weakened tree or a cause, or is it just random with regards to tree, tree of, or is it just random with regards to tree of heaven? Can we have a serious effort to eradicate that cluster by the, by the side of Maryland's roadside? Uh, hmm. They are, they are simply cut right now, and this is simply, and this simply causes thousands of sprouts. Right. So it sounds like two different things. So garlic mustard relationship with weakening oak, oaks. That's interesting. That is very interesting. I've never heard that before. And nor have I noticed that when I'm out at my sites. So um, I'll definitely put that forward. But yeah. I, have no, um, I have no other information for that. Interesting. So then it seems like that was a separate comment about the tree of heaven serious efforts to eradicate that by clusters so yeah you know with tree of heaven you can't just cut it you have to add a little bit of a herbicide to it so you can paint brush that on to your um tree of heaven or you can do a hack and squirt if um that's cutting into the bark getting getting through that uh you know through the xylem and phloem and kind of spraying in some herbicide there you can girdle the tree, um, but uh, which, you know, is cutting out the where the xylem and phloem is all around the tree. And then maybe you don't have to add a herbicide if you don't want. But um, yeah, they'll sprout just like many other trees. Thank goodness, you know, thank goodness trees know how to re re reproduce like that. Um, unfortunately, when it's an invasive aggressive invasive that that becomes unfortunate but thank god they 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 can redo reproduce like that uh i think oh sorry did you have something else to say there heather nope 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 um just you know the um plant protection section is working with the um department of public works in the department and um our state highway administration so i mean they're they're all in contact with each other regarding um Atlantis control. Wow. Yeah. Great. Great. And then, you know, it'll be sad when they take those cattle repairs down, but we won't get into that. <laughs> Beautiful site, but yet we know how bad they are. Okay, Heather, that looks like the end of our questions. Uh, I appreciate everybody tagging along for us. And Heather, I really appreciate this update. So much information. We're getting some messages in here. Great job. Uh, great information. I think um, I'm looking forward to next year's already. So, <laughs> Sounds good. So uh, keep doing what you're doing, Heather. We appreciate that you're taking care of our, our state like that. Thank you, Heather. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. We'll see you in January with Jim, Mc Jim McKay, the zoologist for Wildlife and Heritage Services.